Good morning, everybody. So happy to have you with us this morning um, and throughout our Business Over Breakfast series. I'm Nicola Barrett, Chief Corporate Learning Officer at Emory Executive Education at Goizueta Business School. During December, we've been focusing on shifting paradigms during this era of COVID. And there's certainly lots of shifts on the uh, health and political scenes, but also with our, with our organizations. Um, you and your um, organizations have encountered a host of challenges in 2020. And one among these that's keeping um, many of us up at night is thinking about and planning for and executing on growth strategies. For some of you, you're experiencing runaway growth um, from the, um, the, the, the trucks that roll up to my door. I know who some of you are. Um, for others of us, we are trying to get back to, you know, 2019 levels and rethink um, how we actually how we actually grow. In those pre-COVID times, you know, leaders certainly face challenges of of continuous growth and deciding on which strategy to pursue. Whether it was organic, whether it was through acquisition, you know, extend, innovate, create, um, generate fans. Um, capitalizing on increasing share of wallet of existing, of existing loyal customers. We still have all of those issues, but today layered on those are the complexities of working remotely, this economic slowdown, unemployment, you know, to name a few, which really raises the bar for leaders uh, focused on growth uh, to both engage with teams and the market. This morning, I'm really pleased to have Francisco Crespo join us to share his growth playbook and engage you in exploring the leadership side of, of growth. Francisco is a strategic executive and board member with deep global experience and an impressive track record of leadership delivering transformation and accelerated growth. He's a veteran of the Coca-Cola company and had wide impact across that organization and its bottling system managing large Latin American businesses and creating global growth agenda that improved profitability in every region of the world. Um, he is known for facilitating mission-focused urgency and at Coca-Cola was the unprecedented five-time winner of that company's Woodruff Cup, which recognizes the most outstanding operating unit annually. I believe you have been, um, uh, um, compared to uh, Jose Mourinho, uh, the, soccer, the uh, soccer coach that is known as one of the greatest managers of all time. So I don't know what your soccer skills are like, Francisco, but your, your management skills are up there. Um, as Chief Growth Officer of Coca-Cola, Francisco had oversight of integrated global marketing, corporate strategy, customer and commercial operations. His work included the creation of global growth framework, that anchored in the establishment of a disciplined approach to develop the company's brand portfolio. And he focused on building a global community across the company's operations, which was instrumental in driving new levels of excellence in how the company went to market. Uh, he served on boards of public and related companies in Europe and Latin America. He's currently serving as the director at Coca-Cola European Partners, the largest bottler in the Coke system in revenues and market cap. He currently serves as Goizueta Business School's executive in residence and as a senior advisor for BCG. So we are in excellent hands uh, to have Francisco um, this morning talking to us about growth and leading that growth. Francisco is going to spend about 35 minutes or so discussing growth in his Growth Leaders Playbook, followed by Q&A. He is happy to answer any questions along the way that helps you understand the material. So please put those and any other questions you have in the Q&A section, and we will do our best to um, get them to him so that they can be answered. So thank you, Francisco, for sharing your insights this morning and for your time with us. And I'm really looking forward to learning a lot from you because uh, it is certainly something that is keeping me up at night as well. So over to you, Francisco. Thank you, Nicola. That, that was very, very kind. And uh, I'm, I feel extremely honored to be part of, uh, of the uh, Emory and Goizueta Business School uh, uh, organization. 
and uh, to be here talking with you. I know that, that it's very close to Christmas in a very odd year, so I'm probably, uh, you have a lot of things in your plate and I really appreciate you just uh, spending uh, these uh, next uh, less than an hour, uh, hopefully uh, just uh, taking uh, uh, some time to think about uh, uh, growth in, in a different way. And I think this is meant to be a conversation. I'm, I just have the reflections that I have uh, um, created over three decades uh, working at the Coca-Cola company. Uh, in different parts, uh, being in the marketing area, figuring what is the difference between information and an insight, and how do you use insights to create a love relation between brands and consumers? How do you attach values and emotions to a brand? Um, being a bottler at some point, so having to figure out how do you get the strategy to be cut up in little pieces that somebody can execute in the four or five minutes that they have, and how do you create the incentives for them to be able to uh, align the whole stakeholders into the, delivering that experience for consumers. And I have had the uh, experience of being a general manager of the EU president uh, for uh, almost uh, 12, 15 years, and, and you know, when when you think about how all the different functions collaborate to build a PNL and uh, and what is the role of, uh, of uh, governmental affairs and corporate social responsibility and why uh, um, environmental and social governance that are strategic to the value of a business, uh, you know, you, st you start thinking uh, a lot about, about the business itself. And, and finally, I was honored to be the chief growth officer where you really, can only offer direction, frameworks, metrics, and manage the talent the best you can uh, to get a, a specific result, uh, result. And I think that the first question when you think about growth is why is it important? And I will just offer you two perspectives. The first one is uh, in biological terms, anything that stops growing starts dying. But in sociological terms, when you have a pie that is expanding, you can always share value with more people and more stakeholders. When you have a pie that is static or decreasing, you have a struggle and a fight for pieces of that pie. And I have not even mentioned how important it is to the value of a business. But uh, let's get into it. Um, as you think about uh, human, the, the, the product of human work, you know, you have to put apart common, good, solid work from outstanding, remarkable, exceptional work that is appreciated not only for its beauty, but for its emotional power. And I think when you think about growth, you have to think about that because it's not the same just to navigate on an industry that is growing than swimming much faster and winning compared to everybody else swimming in that lane. I don't think it's the same to just have a booklet and a playbook that has worked and that repeats every year just with incremental and marginal improvements. We are at a time where consumers are having incredible um, amount of new options in their, in their hands and, uh, and industries are being disrupted at speed that the uh, incrementality is, uh, is not even a recipe for survival, much less for success. So just, you cannot repeat the programs uh, just a little bit better. You, you have to think through about what are the drivers of a consumer delight and, and how do you uh, make that uh, a real experience. Then uh, a lot of times we end up just delighting the consumers that we already have in our you know, in our in our portfolio, but uh, one of the strongest ways of growing is by getting new people, uh, new consumers to use our products, and that requires thinking on both sides, not just obsessively focusing on pleasing the already loyal consumers. And when you think about innovation, it is not the same. It is common to replicate, to copy, to react. It is not as common to try to think about what really drives value, where is a different angle and create something new and shape the industry. So you need to move from just uh, uh, complying and competing to leading and hopefully shaping. And that is the path that a true leader uh, uh, follows. 
And uh, finally, just a thought that in the past, we were able to scale human work by uh, creating these functions, but those functions created silos. And that is good for accountability, but the problem is that uh, you really need a coalition where all these functions are collaborating to create superior consumer experiences. So let's get to, to, the, to the simple uh, uh, summary of what are the disciplines. The first one is you, you need to, to see headroom. It is impossible to capture something you cannot see. It would be a miracle. It would have to fall in your hands. So, uh, you know, you have to be able to map where is the growth, where are the opportunities? And this is not mapping yourself, where am I big, but where is the, is the consumer spending and the consumer disposition for the kind of products and, and services that I offer big? And where are the deep profit pools? And, and understanding that and then figuring out where you have the right to win is a very important part, but this requires an attitude. And the attitude, it has to do with this can be done. Uh, I, our, our team as an organization is the one that can crack these much better than anybody else. There will always be barriers around an opportunity, but if you are capable of going around those barriers better than anybody else, well, that is a definition of competitive advantage. Now, once you have established where are the opportunities, you need to build edge. You, you need to build a, a clear explanation of why you are superior to any other uh, competitor. Uh, why in customer eyes, your qual the qualities, the values, the emotions that are associated to your product or your service are stronger and better and more desirable for consumers. And why the way that your consumer experiences your brand is superior and how are you enhancing that experience? Finally, uh, sorry, then you need to understand uh, what is the game that you're playing? Because there are different games in different parts of the world, in different consumer segments, in different uh, usage occasions. You might be playing uh, in early stages where you are an explorer and the, the, the playbook for that is very different than if you're already an established leader. And we will talk a little bit about that. And finally, you need to ensure that you have a healthy, motivated, self-improving ecosystem that works relentlessly to deliver your brand purpose to consumers. So the, big, the first one, the first one is seeing is believing. You know, uh, normally you say, I have to, uh, I will only believe once I see it. Well, this is like putting the question around. Uh, once, you, once you see it, when, once, you, once, once, you, once you believe in it, you will uh, be able to, to see it. And, and I think that it has to do with two dimensions. Uh, the, the two things that, that, that you have to grow uh, your business is either get more consumers to use it or have them find new moments, new occasions in which they use it. It's as simple as that. And by getting those two axes right and understanding, you stop thinking about categories and industries and you start thinking about consumer needs. Because a lot of times we just check how, are, how am I doing in, in, a, in a certain category? And I can give you examples. In Indonesia, we thought that we were doing super well because we were killing uh, in market share our competitor in sparkling soft drinks. But the truth was uh, teas, ready to drink teas and, and juices were killing both of us together. So when you, you need to think about the consumer and, and the occasion in which they're using the product, and, uh, and, and that's when you start seeing that the opportunity is much larger than the normal de definition of where you compete. Um, it, it is about stopping to being self-referenced. In, in our company, we a lot of times thought, well, Mexico is super large, and I was the BU president of Mexico, so probably I benefited from that. But the truth is that when you flip the question and you said, where are the deep profit pools and the potential? Well, uh, there were other countries of other places in the earth, like, uh, like China, where the profit pools were significantly deeper. And the key question was, how do we capture those faster? And finally, we already talked about the attitude. Uh, you have to uh, uh, think that uh, the obstacle is part of the path and that your ability to solving those barriers and creating the bridges is what's going to get you ahead in the game. 
So let's talk a little bit about uh, edge. When you think about um, how do you become, uh, a, a, how do you make your brand to be perceived better than uh, your competitors or other options that they have, the consumer has to, to, to solve that specific occasion. You now understand who are the consumers and what are the use educations and you're focusing on one of them. Well, um, you have to think about, okay, for this consumer and this use education, where do I find a brand truth? We, we spoke before about insights, a brand truth that connects those elements to the brand. And then how do I think about a brand purpose? How do I attach values and emotions that are relevant, differential and relevant for my brand in that specific uh, moment? That's what you call a, a brand architecture. That's how you end up creating the symbols, the values, the personality of your brand in a way that it creates emotional bonding. Uh, you know, uh, reason leads to conclusion. Emotions leads to commitment. That's what you're looking for. Now, you also need to figure out how to do your experience architecture. And the experience architecture is simply put, is how do you create this omni, uh, these, these experiences across omni channels and omni media. You cannot just choose one media or one channel. You need to have several of them, but you have to go back to your brand architecture. What is the consumer I'm looking for? What is the use education? And how am I trying to deliver these in terms of the brand purpose? And uh, for that, you start connecting your messages, your offerings, and your pricing with your channels, your media, and your partners. And then you start building how consumers really experience your product. And, and finally, you have to think about who, which are the brand assets that you are uh, acquiring and creating and enhancing and which are the endorsers that are helping you and the strategic partners. Because to create the credentials of a proper brand architecture and to ensure that you're delivering this you know, in a differentiated and superior way, you need to be sure that you have the right partners. When you think about Chick-fil-A, McDonald's, the partners that Coca-Cola has for quick service restaurants or in, 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 in other areas, uh, brand assets like the Olympics, uh, they do connect with the brand values and with the occasions and the brand uh, the usage moments. Now, the third element is not every game is uh, created equally. You have to learn how to play different games, right? If you are in the early stages, you're probably trying to get your brand to be trialed, your service, your product to be tried, consumers just to try it. Then you want them to repeat it and hopefully eventually adopt it and become loyal. But there is a path to that. So in the, in the, in the left side, when you are an explorer, you need to be disruptive. You're trying to disrupt a current habit. You're trying to change what consumers are doing and for them to consider you as a better alternative. So, uh, you know, you, you have to be incredibly agile. You're looking for physical and mental availability. Uh, eventually, if you have done that properly, you become a challenger. And once you become a challenger, uh, you have now a better scale. You have probably solved a lot of the supply chain issues. But uh, at this point, you have to figure out how do I find a winnable space? And segmentation is key to that because you will have to find in which consumer segment and use education you are closer to being able to create a better position than the incumbent. And out of that, build in the rest of the segments. And, and for that, you will have to persistently over-invest and over-execute, but only once you understand what is your edge. Finally, when you happen to be successful and you're a leader, uh, now you have to solidify the habit and, and stretch the habit that you have at hand. Uh, you, you're, ena you're enabled to collect value. You can, you can get more money to reinvest in, in a virtuous circle of uh, stretching the brand, creating more brand assets, delivering better experiences, making more innovation available. Uh, but, but that can only happen after, once you have gotten there. So, you know, in Coke, if you, if you think about it, for a lot of time, we were trying to apply the playbook of the developed countries. No, oh, in the developed countries, we are uh, innovating. So you let, let's get all these new flavors out there. 
Well, that, that is fine if you are in a country where the brand, where consumers already have tasted your brand, have tried it, repeated it, and they have adopted it. But, but, but if, if you have countries where the brand is just being used once a month or even less than that, uh, you're just confusing them. Now, now you, you have to focus on different things. You have to focus on, on distribution, on, on cold drink availability, on the right occasions. And I think that understanding what is the right playbook for each uh, market is, is a very important part of being successful. Finally, um, you have to build this uh, ecosystem and, and uh, the ecosystem is the one that delivers a superior consumer omni experience. Uh, these coalitions are the ones that um, uh, really is where consumers do touch your uh, message, do touch your product, do experience your service. And, uh, and, and, and that's where you want to be sure that uh, the architecture is, uh, uh, is really uh, being experimented by them, that they are um, feeling it in the, in, the, in the right way. So you have to weave which are the channels, which is the media, what is the right way of, uh, what, what is the right message, who am I talking to now that we have digital, that is something that needs to be done, data-driven personalization, data-driven design, um, and, uh, and, and then, um, you know, you have to think about what is the usage moment I'm trying to build, which are the partners and how do I execute, but to bring together all these partners, you need, a, you need a coalescing narrative, you need a massive transformation purpose, something that everybody out there wants to be a part of. Yeah, if, if you are purposeless, you're not going to attract uh, goodwill from employees trying to work in your company. You're not going to be able to get your customers enthusiastic about uh, selling your product. You're not going to get even your suppliers bringing new stuff for you to innovate. Uh, so you have to find, once again, in your brand purpose, uh, what is the coalescing narrative that articulates this incredible ecosystem to be continuously self-improving the way that consumers experience the brand. Um, so with that, you know, you could, you could argue that there is a way of doing a kind of a, a, a test, right? Uh, how good is a company? And, uh, you know, uh, I think that uh, a lot of times companies are see growth as incremental. So when the business plan starts, uh, what is the industry growing? What was the last three years growth? So let's more or less park over there. Uh, they hardly begin with, okay, where are my consumers? Where are the usage moments? What are the profit pools? And exponentially, what can I capture here? I think uh, there is a lot of uh, blue space in this chart to improve how do you see headroom. Uh, in Building Edge, I think there has been a lot of things done in terms of differentiation and, and, and uh, devising uh, smart uh, advertising campaigns. But remember, advertising, when you use the word advertising, you continue to think in the old model. I send a message to consumers, consumers receive the message, and hopefully when they go to a place to acquire, they will consider my brand. That is you know one way of doing this but now in a digital world you must engage consumers it is not only about the reach and frequency it is really about engagement and it's really about understanding are you a consumer or a non-consumer and what are the usage occasions where, where i can entice you to try my product and repeat it so building edge is about building the right brand architecture, the right experience architecture, and uh, thinking through uh, which are the brand assets and the partners that I need to enhance this uh, brand architecture and experience architecture. Customizing the playbooks, I think by, by, by human nature, we think, oh, this is a different country, this is a different geography, this is a different competitor. So we probably normally do this a, a little bit better. But I think that a lot of times we are just replicating. Oh, this is a good practice. Just replicate it everywhere. And we don't stop to think, wait a second. Yes, that's a good practice, but uh, am I in the right stage? Am I playing the right game? Is that a good practice for the game that I'm playing here? So I think there's still some opportunity there. And finally, I think in connecting networks, as I said at the beginning, we have siloed work. And by siloing work, what we have done is we have really um, 
uh, cut the, the 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 thing in pieces. And 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 the problem is that it breaks apart how consumers perceive a brand. So think think for a second about an airline. And I'm not going to mention any brand. There are very good airlines. When you think about an airline, you, your body, your soul, your spirit is traveling at uh, probably seven sigma, even better than six sigma. Your security is the most important thing and they will ensure that you arrive safe. And then they will hopefully try to make you arrive on time, but safe is their, their, their mantra. Now your bags, your bags, they're probably traveling three sigma. Every now and then they lose it. You, you have to go and find where they are. And so, so it's not the same experience. If, if you think about it, you get into your phone, um, you can do a lot of things. You maybe can choose some of the, um, of the you can book a, a, new, a new flight. You can maybe choose your seat. You can maybe, uh, but, they, but they are upgrading every day, trying to give you more and more uh, uh, things that you can do. So, you know, you have maybe some, some areas that are super good, some areas that are okay, and some areas that are not that great. And consumer at the end of the day, when they think about a brand, they're thinking about the omni experience that they get everywhere. And that's why connecting the networks and ensuring that there is a, a, a consistency all across the ecosystem is incredibly important. A lot of times in, in, in industries like mine, um, the customer guys are just trying to recruit new customers and the brand guys are just trying to earn uh, um, uh, can uh, awards. Uh, but, but there is a way of brand building in which you need to be ensured that what you're doing in a customer is speaking and delivering a specific brand purpose and message in that usage occasion. So, uh, you know, if, if you have uh, an, an airline as a customer and uh, airlines have a lot of early flights, maybe that's where you want to try that product where you are trying to build in the breakfast occasion. But that, those are afterthoughts, not, not, not something that is uh, weaved in, in an integrated way. And I think this is one of the largest challenges that companies still have or opportunities if we put it on the other side. So with that, just a few thoughts on leadership. I, I think that leadership is probably one of the most important things that, uh, that move human organizations, uh, if not the most. And I say that because I don't think leaders are uh, just the uh, CEO or, or even the uh, ozone of a, of, a, of a company. I think that leaders are uh, all the uh, chief of different tribes in an organization that are capable of uh, inspiring, motivating, and, and, uh, and uh, enabling people to collaborate in ways that unleash value. And, and there's a lot of leaders uh, sometimes those leaders don't even have people reporting to them, but just the way that they speak do make a difference in the way the uh, collectivity thinks about a challenge or an opportunity. And, and that's why I think that it is important that we all become better leaders. Uh, we are right now in a moment where um, obviously there is a, a recession uh, because of the pandemic. And the, the, the leadership immediately jumps into, okay, we need to preserve cash, which is the right thing to do, right? You need to, to, to preserve cash in order to survive, in order to protect what is remaining of, of the jobs and, and the business that is there. But, but, but immediately we have to think about, okay, so how are we going to reinvent this business? Because the, 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 the uh, cutting, cost cutting and, and, and cash preservation uh, do not grow the pie. And if we do not grow the pie, then we are really not up to being uh, just uh, okay. Um, for that, you need hope. You, you, you need to believe that there are opportunities. You need to embrace that the, the opportunities out there will have uh, barriers in front of them, but that you are capable with the team around you to build bridges that are better than any other to get uh, to that opportunity. Um, obviously, you, you need to be discontent, you need to wish more, but you need to be proud of what you are. If, if you're not proud of what you are, you will always be uh, doubting your ability to get uh, extraordinary things done. Um, I believe after three decades that you need to trust your karma, and I think I was not that very good trusting my karma. 
uh, relations are built out of trust and, 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 and relations is the only thing that you're left with and that really matter uh, because uh, that people that, uh, that you have interacted, the quality of how you have interacted, the value of the personal relation, the strategic value that you have created for them uh, the, uh, is, is what will make that bond uh, stronger. And, and, and it comes back, it, it helps you. Uh, you would never believe the amount of people that will be willing to help you uh, when you need, if you have done this properly. So this is not about a career advancing faster than other people. This is a career about building the strongest possible relations with every person that is around you and trying to uh, help them be better and, uh, and, and doing that in, in the best possible way. Um, discussing, debating, having your ideas challenged is actually good. It's not something to get angry or, or be annoyed with. Cognitive strength of an organization is derived from respectful cognitive wrestling. Obviously, it has to be respectful. You need to build up on the ideas. Just criticizing with no option is, doesn't lead anywhere, but to, to being uh, angry and, and angry never leads to good places. But, but, but good, genuine, acceptable questions only make ideas better. And, and accepting that and embracing that is an important part of being a real leader. Um, be the discipline you want to see in the world. A lot of times we say, well, we have to be more disciplined, we have to be more disciplined, but when we see what we do in terms of, of reflecting about who we really are and what are our strengths, we might not be as disciplined. We, we might be just uh, putting a lot of eyes outside and not uh, as many eyes inside. And, uh, and a lot of times we are annoyed when other people are late, but we are always a little bit late or or we want other people to be more um, uh, collaborative and, and, and keep, uh, sharing more information and we are not uh, sharing as, uh, as much. So I think that uh, um, if you want change, it needs to begin with you if you're a real leader. And then uh, listen with an open heart. It is, it is uh, it, words uh, have emotions attached to them. And uh, just listening to, if, if you would read what people say, you would never get the total depth of, uh, of having a human conversation and listening to their intent, to their body, to their intonation, to the emotions. And when, when you touch the people's emotions and, and you help them move to better places, that's where you are building uh, relations and a coalition that will take uh, the cause that you're fighting for to a better place. And finally, embrace fluidness. It is a world where the uh, change is here and, 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 and change is happening. Uh, the, there's no way of, of trying to grab the past and, 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 and avoiding it. Uh, that only will make you unhappy. That will only create a lot of, 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 of this distress. Um, fluidness uh, opens the opportunity to shape things. When th things are fluid, uh, you, you have an opportunity to shape in which direction that goes. And, and when you see it with those eyes, then there's a lot of opportunities uh, in your hands. So with that, I hope that I was in my 35 minutes and that we can have a real conversation as we promised. I never wanted this to be just a one-way uh, talk. Francisco, yes, we've got lots of questions. So um, actually, let me just, uh, so we can have a conversation. Let's uh, do it face to face. Um, the first one we've been going backwards and forwards on in your um, your growth IQ, it doesn't equal a hundred percent. Is it supposed yes, to? Because yes, yes, yeah, because the intention is not to to be a hundred percent. I'll put the chart just a second. Mm -hmm. What what I'm saying, and 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 remember, I I am proud, discontent, but but discontent significantly because that's what I think makes you better every time is when I think about organizations that I have worked and I have seen, I think that there is a, a significant, I don't know if 85 is fair, but I think there is a significantly larger opportunity to uh, map uh, where are the headrooms, uh, where are the profit pools, and have the deep conversations about what are the right to win and how are we gonna prioritize and, and think about them. 
I think that, you know, and maybe it's unfair to say we are 15% there, but I'm just trying to say there's a huge opportunity. On building edge, I'm trying to say that, you know, it's something that we do, and maybe 25% is too, too small, and maybe it should be 40%, but I still think that uh, we normally work very hard on brand architectures and we put a lot of thinking on what is going to be the message and the place, the position we want to have. We don't put as much thinking on how do we want this to be experienced and what are the, uh, the stakeholders and partners that we need for this to be experienced in a way that the purpose is properly delivered. I think customizing playbooks, we all do better. I think that there's still always opportunity to be better at that because sometimes we just shift. So it doesn't need to add horizontally to 100%. Each, 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 uh, each of the disciplines is 100%. And I'm just trying to say that maybe we customize playbooks and build edge better than we connect networks and see headphones. Mm -hmm. So we really need a tool to be able to understand where we are today, where do we put our efforts in and where, how are we making some progress? Indeed. Um, so just reading some of the questions here, um, Amy Bars uh, said, you mentioned the difference between engaging the brain and the heart. Can you say more about that? Yes, yes, thank you for the question. So um, people, I know buy products, you know, if, if you're or, or a service, but people souls buy into brands. When when you're buying a Coca-Cola, yes, you are buying a product, maybe a can. Uh, it's cold and it brings a, a delicious, uh, uh, refreshing product inside. But but what but what your soul is buying is really the brand attached to it. So what you're really buying are the values and the emotions that that make you feel. You're buying into optimism. You're buying into happiness. You're buying into uh, uplifting yourself, not only physically, but mentally to see the joy in the world and the good in each other. And, and, and when you feel that you need that kind of refreshment, you're in a, in, a, in a dramatically different place. If I would tell you, yeah, well, Coke uh, takes 97% uh, of your thirst, uh, the brand will not be never as interesting as when, when I tell you that Coke uplifts you and refreshes your soul and spirit to, and, and your body to see uh, the joy in the world and the good in each other. I think that that is the difference. A, a reasoning uh, drives you into a conclusion. Okay, so this kills 99% of the germs. Okay, so now I know that 1% of the germs might be around, but 99 sounds like great. But if I'm buying in a brand that says, uh, we, we care for, for your safety or your, then, then I'm in a different level of engagement. And I think that that is what I was trying to to um, uh, make the point. Uh, I hope that I that I did this time better. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it begs the question about what, what if you're um, creating something like cardboard boxes? And, you know, ha is that where you have to go to the sort of the more rational side or, or is there an emotional there, there are industries. There, there are always industries where where you will have a more rational side, but even in the rational side, you have to think through what am I enabling consumers to get done. Mm -hmm. And 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 here and here's an example. Probably you know this, and uh, I'm sorry if if anybody works in a competing. Uh, but it's just an example, okay? It's just I, I like to try to 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 bring things to life. Um, yeah, if, if I tell you, uh, you know, we have to organize our closet. You're already bored, right? I mean, organize the closet. That sounds like a chore. That sounds like unfun. And, and we need boxes for that. And, you know, we're going to... Now, if I tell you, let's go to the container store. <laughs> it, it sounds different. It sounds like fun. I'm going to find all these solutions. And these solutions are going to look so cool that I'm going to want to have my, my closet organized in this way because it's going to make my life easier every morning. I'm going to find clothes that I don't normally find. So that, that's where you get to the emotions. What am I enabling consumers to get done? Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Does that help? Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, Michael Young asked, restructuring is necessary for any business to grow as its markets change. Coke is certainly known for doing this every 18 months or so. However, the process of restructuring is difficult, hard, slows growth during the transition. So how do you know when it's time to restructure and to what extent? Yeah, that's an outstanding question. I think that um, you have to do a couple of things. I think that when, when you end up having to restructure, it's either because something uh, extraordinary happened, like a pandemic, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, it's extraordinary. I don't know, uh, in a country, an earthquake, or it, it has to be something, something massive. Uh, or I think the only other option is because you had been small mistakes for a long time. You had been uh, organized and structured in things that were not optimal because you should be every year adjusting, getting a little bit smarter on how do you form teams? Where do you need to put the right people? So restructuring in itself, and, uh, unless it, it has to do with, with uh, and, and then, and then uh, to be fair in the middle, you might be disrupted, right? You, and, and, and sometimes uh, it's hard to see who's going to disrupt you and disruption can, have, can happen faster. But I think that if you could, be doing proper risk management. And I think boards are learning how to do this in better and better ways. Risk management in, in decades ago, even years ago, it was, yeah, yeah, the finance team should do this. And, you know, just uh, ask them to send this boring report and we will read all the horrible things that can happen. Risk management is not about catastrophizing. It is really about understanding in materiality matrix, what can, massively damage your or, or, or you know in, with different levels what can from massively to almost non damage the reputation of your business and the value of your business and and what are the things there and what can you do to try to uh, address those contain those uh, or or work around those if they happen and that includes uh, uh, natural disasters things that you cannot um, avoid from happening but that you can be better prepared if they if they happen. So I think that uh, the the better you do uh, your strategic planning, the better you do your your uh, risk uh, uh, assessments and, and planning. Uh, hopefully, uh, the less amount of times that you will need to do massive restructuring, and you would end up more reshaping and adjusting and and, and fine tuning. Mm -hmm. uh, now, when when you have to do it. I think there's only one way to do it, and, and it is beginning with being human. Uh, there are people on the line. They have no fault in this. Uh, if anything, if, you know, they are the victims of what has happened. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, 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 and they have given you time, uh, sometimes a lot of time. Uh, you need to help them walk through what is happening, what are the options, how can you help them? And, and, and ensure that the, the process is, is as fair and as possible, uh, humanly uh, contained, um, and, uh, and, and then really avoid from, from having another one. Right. Thank you. For that, you have to grow. <laughs> yes. So um, David Lilly asks, how can a small operational and decidedly unsexy company that makes plastic parts or repairs rooftops connect with um, the heart of a, a B2B customer. And can I add on another bit to that? Sure. And how do you do it when you don't have a large marketing budget? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, I mean, the, the beauty of this new world is that um, you can do a lot of things in digital in, and, and, and get so many people excited sharing their thoughts in, in, uh, in, uh, in very low cost and, uh, and with a lot of passion. People have a, an incredible amount of passion for just sharing their thoughts when, when you just put the right question in the right uh, space and, and, and they react to that. Um, and, and I think that's maybe a point I didn't make when I was talking about the explorer, the challenger, and the leader. You know, when you're a leader, a brand like Coke, you really have to properly 
do research because the decisions are, 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 are you know, it's a big value at stake. But when you're in the early stages, you, you, you have to, I mean, the market is your best test. You, you have to try stuff and, and, there, and, and, and there's much cheaper ways of doing business than, than, than when, when you're an explorer than when you're a leader. But I think that it goes back. I, I, I don't understand exactly what are the problem they're trying to solve. I would begin by not calling myself a plastic uh, part company, but, but, but trying to think, okay, so what am I enabling consumers? Whoever buys what I sell, what am I enabling to, to get done? And, 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 and why? Because if people do that, it's because they either need it or want it or is important for their health or life. But there has to be a reason why they're doing it and they need this part. And, and if you get to that, then, then you can start uh, getting closer to the, to the emotions. Mm -hmm. but, but it's very hard with, with just uh, so, uh, so little information, but, but there, are, there, there, there are ways. So it's a bit like the, the, the story of the tire manufacturer who was selling to airlines and they stopped selling tires and they started selling safe landings, right? They started yeah, talking yeah. about themselves as being. Well, that, that's a great business. You know that because they are always landing, those tires need to be changed uh, very often. Mm -hmm. So, the, you know, the difference between a tire blowing up while the plane is landing and, and how much that affects your security, plus having to change it because it's not an easy process. The, the, then you are in the emotional side of just I sell tires. Yeah. yeah. Um, we've got another question from uh, Amy Serlin. Uh, coming out of the pandemic um, and, and the impact that this has had on business, what are the most important learnings that you will take forward in your um, business plans, your overall thinking, your the, the work you do on your board, et cetera? Yeah, that's that's excellent. Um, I think that uh, there are um, there are a bunch of of, uh, of silver linings uh, on on this. I think that uh, uh, we can actually spend more time home. I mean, uh, it's it's not that difficult, and, and you don't need don't, you don't really need to travel so much for to so many meetings. Uh, a lot more things can be done uh, virtually, and and they actually reasonably work. They're not the same thing. They're not the same thing. Uh, you, you eventually, I, I don't think companies will uh, go back to nine to five Monday through Friday. I think companies will go back to offices because you because there is a connection. There is the this, this different way. In a Zoom meeting, you're already on, on Bobby and I'm already with my card here. Uh, while you're walking down the hallway to grab a coffee, uh, you can ask about, uh, well, what do you th really think about this project? You're going to have a different answer. It's going to be uh, probably a less guarded and, 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 uh, and uh, a more genuine uh, answer, if you will. So it is important to go back and, and, and connect people around real human moments. But I don't think we're going to go back to exactly where we were. I think we have also found that uh, we can uh, e-commerce a lot more things, that, uh, that there's a lot of things. I mean, I still want to go and, and touch my avocados because I want to know that if I can eat them today or tomorrow. So that's, that's not going to change. I will continue to go there. I still love to go and be surprised on the wine uh, space with something I have not seen and, and talk to the guy and hear a little bit the story. So I'll probably continue to do that. But, but if it's something that, that is similar to a chore, that that you know i don't really need to see it and and, and it's not really fun uh, or educating probably i will i will not go back to uh, having to carry a lot of stuff uh into my into my house it's 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 really convenient this way um but i think that uh, the the largest challenge that every company or most companies have with the pandemic is how do you uh, swiftly rapidly uh, and with uh, and with true leadership, move out of cost cutting and into growth, because mm -hmm. I think that it is reasonable. I'm not criticizing. It is reasonable. You really need to get certain things done. But the key question is, how are you going to emerge out of this, and what is the new company you're going to become? If consumers are adjusting and changing in certain ways, 
how are you gonna, what are the opportunities? And I would begin there. If you see non-opportunities, you only see problems, well, uh, work harder. You need to be a better leader. You have to find opportunities in, in the way the, the, the world is shaping. What are you gonna shape? What are you gonna shape as the world comes out of the pandemic? And, and, uh, and, and I think that is the challenge that we have to put top of our head, top of the leaders we are around. Uh, this is great, okay, you have thought through how to uh, preserve cash and cost cut. Uh, what are the opportunities? What do you think we can shape? Uh, mm -hmm. What is the new idea here? Right. Okay, thank you. And there's just in the chat, there's been a, a question about how I'm asking the questions. Um, and there's mm -hmm. two things going on. I'm looking at how many thumbs up there are. So those questions rise to the top. So if you like a question, vote for it. Um, it will come up to the top of my list. Um, and then also just getting a, a, a mix of questions around there. Um, Sabash Sama asks, in your opinion, what are the key metrics that are most relevant across the growth phases? Uh, I think that you have metrics um, in different uh, levels. I, I think that uh, uh, the, the, the super uh, top level, you need the, the metric of uh, consumers. Uh, mm -hmm. How many... Uh, how many consumers do you have? Which, which is a basic question. A lot of companies don't know how to answer it. Uh, how many consumers do you have? Uh, mm -hmm. Who's your consumer? Do you know what is the potential of people that are non-consumers? Right. Um, then a little bit more complicated, but, but very much desirable. Uh, what are the usage moments that you have identified as large? I mean, in Coca-Cola, it's kind of easy. It's meals, breaks, and then you can get uh, spending time uh, uh, leasing uh, uh, in-house, uh, socializing outside of house, you, you have other spaces, but, but it's very clear where the deep profit pools are and what are those occasions. Um, but, you know, understanding how many people are using your brand in those occasions and what are the profit pools in those occasions, I think those are metrics that you need to have in the first discipline. On the second one, when you get to edge, you need to understand um, not only uh, brand awareness and, and brand preference, I mean, that, that, that obviously you need, but you need to understand uh, what are your, um, uh, your differentiating attributes, those that, that you want to rank better than competitors, those, those that are building your edge. What, what, are, what are those? Uh, is it uh, upliftment? Is it refreshment? Uh, if those are the ones, well, you better start measuring and understanding if you're really doing better than your competitors. And if you have chosen a particular segment and occasion, hopefully you will be able to narrow it down to, to that uh, battle that is so important to win. Um, and then on the executional side, I think you need to measure the key experience uh, the delivery indicators, you know, um, uh, distribution levels, a share mm -hmm. of visible inventory, a cold drink availability. Uh, it depends on the business. I know I'm, I'm talking about the ones that I that are easy for me because I have thought about them 30 years. But 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 it's not the logic is the same. It's mm -hmm. what do I need. What are the metrics I need to do a, a headroom map? What are the metrics I need for my brand architecture? Uh, to for, for me to know that my brand architecture is superior and what are the metrics that I need to have to know that my brand delivery, my experience delivery is superior. And, uh, and, and then those will build the, the, the usual ones, right? Uh, what is your uh, p and 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 your sales? And, uh, but that would be built out of those. And, um, and hopefully you're also measuring something on purpose, right? Uh, something about how many people's lives have I made the better. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So we've got time for one more question. I can see there are lots in here, but the one that's got the most votes, um, Steve White, thank you. Um, you place a very high value on interpersonal relationships and fluidity. How do you see us reconciling the value lost in these um, dimensions with an increasingly virtual landscape? Oh, that's an excellent question. And I, and I think it goes back to, I think underneath that one, there was the, be the discipline you want to be. You, you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. it, it is so easy to get sucked into this thing. I mean, I call this poison. 
I, I myself, so many times I'm having dinner, something comes up in my mind. Uh, I know I'm getting old, I'm 55 now, so maybe it's just me. But I begin by, uh, uh, I don't know, somebody asked me, so what time is our flight? Oh, I have it here. But I end up checking my mails, uh, answering a, 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 a WhatsApp or, uh, you know, and, 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 and then that is cutting the relationship that I was having, having there. It's, it's, um, it's something that requires our discipline. We, we need to, to value. I, I think I was saying that there's a silver lining. Uh, I, uh, I, I know that this year I have called my parents, uh, if not every day, every two days. I know that in the, in the past years I was not doing that. And, and, and I have no excuse. I have no excuse. But now that I've discovered that it's easier than what I thought, I, I don't want to lose. I, I, I don't want to change. I, I want the pandemic fixed, but I don't want the pandemic to fix the frequency with which I call them. And, and I think the same way about the friends. Uh, you know, a, a lot of times, and, and I'm, uh, I have promised myself as I have, and as I am in this new phase of my life, um, you know, a career and a professional large size, it gets you to think, okay, what is this conversation for? What is the decision that needs to be made? What it, and, but, that, but that gets in the way of, of just having a purposeless conversation, which is what builds uh, relations, you know, mm -hmm. just how are you? What, what are you doing? What, what's going on in your life? I mean, uh, I didn't call you to sell you anything, to buy anything, to get you to accept that the, our family vacation is going to be here or there. I just called to, to hear about you. Wonderful. So um, thank you so much, uh, Francisco. I need you to please stop sharing. That's one last thing yes. for you to do. Um, there was a question about, is this going to be a, um, uh, is there going to be a program about this? And actually that is something that um, Emory Executive Education is working on. Um, and uh, Francisco is um, one of the practitioners that we are um, uh, exploring that idea with. So uh, you all gave me an idea about um, sending out a survey to everybody that was on this uh, webinar. Um, and maybe we can get your thoughts too, as we think about what would be most impactful um, in this sort of growth and purpose space for, um, uh, for a learning uh, initiative. So with that, um, again, thank you so much, um, Francisco. I'm gonna turn over to my colleague, Pam. Thank you. Pam, you're on mute. I know the you, it's a bad habit these days and I yes our zoom world so thank you again Francisco for sharing your insights oh, you. experiences and especially those leadership ingredients we had a lot of comments in the chat a lot of love coming your way in the chat from our oh, thank you thank you thank you all yes it was such a pleasure to have you and we also want to say thank you to our wonderful attendees um, who have joined many of them have joined us uh, over week. So thank you for taking time out of your busy day. And just a quick reminder that uh, today's a recording of today's webinar will be available on the Emory Executive Education LinkedIn page. Um, just a little bit later today, the link uh, is in the chat and we'll be sure and get that reposted. Um, as well, we just have a few quick things to share with you uh, before we leave today. We are continuing our business over breakfast. It will be our final one for 2020 um, with uh, the CEO of Crawford and Company, Rohit Verma. COVID happened, now what? Um, and so uh, Rohit will be sharing some of his insights uh, from his experiences. And then coming in January, uh, we'll be talking with Rebecca Messina, who's the former CMO of Uber, about brands in an uncertain world and having a conversation on sustainability with Goizueta faculty member, Wes Long. Of course, we also have uh, some wonderful upcoming courses and workshops. You can find out more about that on the Emory Executive Education website. So with that, Francisco, do you have uh, any parting shots across the bow that you'd like to make uh, for us as we head back into our day today? No, oh, thank you. Thank you. Have a happy holidays and uh, uh, 2021 be a thousand times better than this year. And uh, we should anyway be grateful for being here. Thank you so much, Francisco. And thank you, Pam, and thank you all for joining us this morning.